I considered myself wealthy. I think I sold something like five or six pelts. God, in the Pira Park stunk for about a week. I mean, the smell of skunks in that area. And no one knew. No one knew. And my mother, to the day she died, didn't know it was me. <laughs> I would never tell her. <laughs> I had lots of dates. As I say, once you have wings and bars, <laughs> they flock. <laughs> I did a fabulous job. The guys were, they, I, I, they, they wanted an encore, but I didn't have another, another song. <laughs> Piece of flack, I'm right to my table. Put a hole in the table about two inches around. If I was standing, I wouldn't be here. I would have had no head or anything. My 14th mission was uh, terrible. It was then I should have realized this is a girl. <laughs> we have a baby for you. And I said, tell him we're going on vacation. <laughs> it's God, family, faith, and country. Today is Saturday, June 17th, 2006, and we are in Yonkers, New York. Please tell me your name. Uh, my name is Frank Farrell. I was actually born Francis Farrell. And when were you born? I was born August 30, 1923. I was born in New York City. Do you have any nicknames, anything like that? Yes, my nickname, which I'm not very happy with, is Teeny. How did you get that nickname? That, I really don't know. I, I really don't know. I think it was from my grandmother. <laughs> okay, and what was your grandmother's name? My grandmother's name, one of them was Nicolina, Nicolina Coza. And uh, my other grandmother was uh, Mary. Mary Farrell. And your grandfather's? My grandfather's names were Giuseppe Coza, and my other grandfather was Anthony. Now that's spelled without the H like Mark Anthony. And how about your parents? What were their names? My father was Frank, and my birth mother was Josephine, and my mother who raised me was Lavina. So tell me a little bit about um, your birth mother and your... Well, um, I was born in uh, 23, as I said, and we lived at my father's second floor, I think, in my father's, father's uh, family's house. And it was a freak fire, and my mother was burnt, in a, burnt to death in a fire. And I was 23, 23 days old. So where were you when this fire occurred? Well, when the fire occurred, uh, somebody from down, downstairs ran up to uh, try to extinguish the fire and save my mother and had me, and had taken me out. Otherwise, I guess I would have died too. And uh, tell me something, do you know anything about your grandparents, had, uh, what they were like? Or? Well, I, I know my mother's parents uh, a lot better than, I know my maternal grandparents a lot more than I did my, pat, my paternal because I was like around three years old or two and a half or three to four years old when my father's parents died. Uh, I do know uh, my father's father, my grandfather, was a, uh, a ladies' boot maker. He made ladies' boots. Of course, then he went into shoes, and I guess his business didn't last too long. But uh, he came to this country in the 18, early 1880s because he was a citizen, and he became a citizen in November of, 19, of 1887. And I have his citizenship papers. At that time, uh, after he became a citizen, he brought my maternal grandmother's mother in from Italy, and uh, so she would have been my great-grandmother, and uh, she came here in 1888. Now, my mother's, my mother's people I was very close to because um, I, we were always at grandma's house, and uh, they came from a my father's people came from Rome. Uh, they're, they're, 
so I consider myself a Roman. And uh, my, mother's, my mother's family, my mother's mother and father, came from a village called in the province of Avellino. And it's somewhere north east of Naples. Uh, my grandfather was uh, an Italian bread baker. That was his business in Italy, and he brought that with him to this country. Uh, I would imagine they came here prior to 1897, because my birth mother was born in this country in 1897. But I spent a lot of time with my grand grandparents because uh, when my birth mother died, I, was, I stayed with my mother's brother's family for a while and then with my father's sister's family. So I would shuttle back and forth between the two. And then uh, I, my father married uh, Lavina in 1926. And my brother was born. Well, my grandmother was a tremendous part of my life. We used to go to her house. The whole family did, everybody. I mean, all, all my mother's uh, uh, sisters and brothers and their family would congregate uh, at her house, at grandma's house, every Saturday. And I tell the story about we as kids could never leave the table after dinner until my grandfather finished his dinner. That's kind of bringing up was, I mean, he was, uh, it was respect. I mean, that's what it was. Uh, my grandfather uh, had, had his bakery uh, in, the, in the back of, the backyard of his, uh, of his house in Mount Vernon. And he used to also make his homemade wine in the basement. And I got my first taste of wine when I was seven years old. And I haven't stopped since. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, the, uh, Grandma, and our, uh, Grandma had, uh, I think she had six kids, seven, seven kids, and uh, we were all close. We had, uh, there were 14 grand, grandchildren, and uh, uh, six of us grew up in Yonkers and in Hastings as practically as brother and sister, because my, my mother's two sisters married two brothers. So everybody, and we were all close yeah. growing up. So tell me a little bit about um, what your house was like growing up and where that was. Well, I grew up, we moved, we moved from New York uh, to uh, Yonkers, New York. Uh, Yonkers, New York in 1928 was not the same as it is today. Today the city has almost 200,000 people. When we moved up here, it was was a village of about 80,000. Uh, my, my parents bought a house in the northest part of the city, northern, uh, northern Yonkers, and it was an isolated area called Napira Park, and it was named after some Indian tribe. And, they, and we had the Nepahan River go by, and the Sawmill River Parkway, and uh, our, our town, our neighborhood, was about three quarters of a mile long, and I would say less than less than a, a quarter of a mile wide. We only had about a hundred families. They were all one family and two family houses. Uh, they, we were all white collar and blue collar families. Uh, we grew up. We grew up during the depression, and no one. No one was on home relief or no one was on welfare. Uh, I went to school two blocks from where I lived, and the school was practically the southern border of, uh, of our, little, uh, our little area. From the school south, about a mile and a half, was nothing but woods. Uh, the, the eastern border of our little, little area was the Sawmill Creek, Sawmill Parkway, which hadn't been completed until 
it was starting when, when we moved up there, so it didn't get completed until the late 30s. And then our, our northern border was Hastings on Hudson, but between our last street in the Pier Park to their first street, was a quarter of a mile of wooded area. It's actually a farm. Our western border was a cemetery and a uh, wooded area going into North Broadway, which I would say is where we, where we used to play. In that area. And, uh, and then we had a uh, country club, uh, Hudson River Country Club, it's part of that border. And uh, Boyce Thompson, Institute, which was a, uh, um, I think they were associated with Cornell University, and they used they they used to experiment on fruits and vegetables, mostly apples, peaches, pears, and grapes, and that's where we got our fruit. Uh, so, what kinds of things did you do when you were playing? Like, what was the day like outside of school? Well, we. We didn't, we never had mail delivery for the first three or four years of my life there. We used to have to walk across the, the parkway, which had ended uh, there, to a railroad station, and uh, everybody had a, their own, uh, his own um, mail, mailbox. It was a, um, It, we were all assigned our own mailbox, and there was a station master, and that's how we got our mail. The train would pull up, drop off the mail, mail bags. He'd, he'd sort it out, which still all the kids would stand there and watch him, and then we'd pick up our mail and walk home. I did that from the time I was six years old. And then, uh, then approximately the time I was 10 or 11, uh, we started to get mail, mail delivery uh, at, our, at our house. We had a trolley car that ran from the end of where we lived to the center of, uh, of the city of Yonkers, which was about five, five miles away. That was the old number five that we called the Tournable Trolley. And uh, that's how I went to junior high school and high school was by trolley car. We, I walked to first six grades in grammar, grammar school and uh, that school is still there. My, both my kids went to kindergarten there. My granddaughter graduated in sixth, sixth grade from there. And that school goes back to pre-World War I. And on the side of the school was a uh, ball field, which we considered ours. And uh, that's, where we, that's where we did all our, all our ball, ball playing volleyball, practice our golf, golf swings on the, in the outfield. And uh, growing, growing up in the Pira Park, I would say it was, it was like, I, I consider myself a country boy. Because most of us had BB guns. Uh, myself and my friend Johnny, Johnny Quinlan, used to trap muskrats along the river, river bank and in the swamp up by Hastings. And the man from Sears would come in every two weeks and buy up our pelts for $2.75. And when you're 12, 12 years old, $2.75 is a lot of money. And uh, the only problem is we, in the winter we'd have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to check the traps before we went to school. But that one winter we did, we did I, I considered myself wealthy. I think I sold something like five or six pelts. And uh, then I had a paper route when I was 15, uh, which lasted only a couple of months because I had, was, I had to walk a mile just to get to the papers and then a mile on my route. And I, at 15, it was just, uh, I, I had more things to do. So uh, I had, we had uh, a lot of friends in, in, uh, in the Pira, growing up in the Pira Park. We have the distinction of having grown, I have the distinction of growing up with a, a, a young fellow who later on became an atomic energy professor and worked with Enrico Fermi on the atom bomb. 
Kenny Miller, and he had gotten 100 on every single region, New York State Regents exam that was given. That was brilliant. Uh, what, were your parents, what were your parents like? His parents. Your, his pa your parents. Oh, <coughs> my, your my parents. father. My father was a was a printer. My father finished high school, and uh, he had his own printing printing business when I was young, and then a larger print shop took it over, and he worked for them. Uh, my mother never worked. And my mother, uh, maybe if she did, she worked in my in my grandfather's bakery. And it may be just uh, uh, after school or so. Uh, but my father, my father, I, I uh, was a World War One veteran. Was wounded. He uh, never missed a day's work until the time he really got sick. And during the during the depression, he he, we did very well. He always worked. Never, uh, I made a good a good income, and uh, he was the eldest of his of his uh, brothers and sisters. There were eight, and um, when my grandparents passed away, the money was left to my father to take care of his siblings because they were they were very young too. Some of them were very young. And he put, he put the money up here in Yonkers, in one of the banks. In 1928, we moved here. And in 1929, the bank failed. And my father had always thought that it was his responsibility. So he, uh, it's a good thing he made a good, a good income, because he took care of his sisters and his two, two brothers, who, by the way, his two brothers died very, very young. They were in their, in their 40s. And uh, Albert, uh, his next oldest brother, was, uh, died of cancer. Uh, Alexander, uh, I don't know really. It was uh, TB or something like that in those days. His sisters, only two married. Uh, one of them died in an automobile accident. One of them moved to Cali California, married a druggist. Uh, she moved to L.A. And um, but my father, my father was was able to uh, take care of everybody. And you said you have a brother. Well, I have a yeah. So how did you and your brother get along? Oh, well, we got along like brothers. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't let anybody touch him. <laughs> maybe maybe I pushed him around a bit. But I wouldn't let anybody, anybody, even even my best friend, who who one time we were we were not kids then, we were not teens, and uh, and he he, uh, he he started after my brother, and I I, I went after my, I went after my best my best friend, I was lay off. Uh, my brother was a marine, World War Two, and uh, I was his best best man. He was my best best man at my wedding. We had a good life. Uh, I had a lot of I had a lot of fun. my three best best friends going back to friends in Imperial Park were Marty Urcho, Fred Dando, and Bobby McElroy. And we stayed. M Marty and I stayed friends even after after the service. Bobby McElroy stayed in uh, in Florida. And retired from the Navy out of Florida. Freddie is still around. I, I speak with Freddie on the phone. He lives not too far from me, uh, maybe once every twice a month. Marty passed away at the age of 61. And uh, I was his best, best man, and he was an usher at my, my wedding. I'll tell you a story about how he met his wife. There were, we were, we were all out of the service. We were all standing on a corner, uh, which, which was our favorite pad, pastime. And, and it, this girl would come by in her car and go whipping around that corner. And she was pretty. I mean, uh, she, I would consider, I, we, we used to think she looked like Ava Gardner. And, and uh, Marty says, 
I got to get a date with her. I got to get a date. She was younger than Marty. I would say maybe five or six years younger. And uh, we, were at, we were in one of our watering holes and we were going out for New Year's Eve and Marty didn't have a date. And I said, I looked up her name in a telephone book, dropped a nickel in the box. Marty was at the bar and I got her on the phone and I said, hey Marty, there's somebody on the phone that wants to talk to you. <laughs> she didn't know him. <laughs> and that's how they started going out. So it sounds like you had a lot of fun. Yeah. So how about in high school before you left for the service? What was I, high school like? High school, high school was great. High school was just a, a, a about a mile from where I'm li from where we're doing this talk, and uh, this area was all wooded area, and uh, we used to walk home. Usually, it was about two and a half miles to save a nickel or buy a bottle of Pepsi Cola. Uh, I still go to my high school reunions. We started uh, at the 50th reunion. And we now we're at our 65th, and, and we still we still all meet. And high high school was fun. High school was real fun. I had, uh, I, I had we had good teachers, we had, had good class classmates, we had good sporting events. And in my senior year, I we my friend Freddie Dandov and I had a dollar bet that whoever brought a book home do homework would lose the dollar bet, and I won. The reason I won is Freddie didn't know, but I had set up a study hall period for the last period of the day. So I did all my homework in the study hall and in the library, and I won the buck. <laughs> but uh, hi high school, it was three years. We did uh, six years, I did six years in grammar school, three years in junior high school, and uh, three years in high school sophomore, junior, and senior year. Uh, I was in the male glee, glee club for about two weeks. And the guy says, he kept putting me with the tenors, put me with the baritones. He said, listen, <laughs> why don't you take up something else this period? <laughs> so I <laughs> did the thing in the male the senior choir. <laughs> but. Um, we had, it was a good high school. We were called we were called the country country club. That's, we had uh, we had a great football team, uh, good baseball team, good track track team. We had excellent students. Uh, my senior my senior year, of course, uh, I'm talking now about coming out of the service. I would say 90 percent went to college. We, the, the all over, all around, the, all around the country. Uh, like I said before, I had, I had, I had terrific, terrific teachers. We had a great principal too, Doc, Doc Kelly. He, he took care of all of us. Uh, any one of us before the war, like myself, who were preparing for college, he made sure we had the right, right things, right subjects, and. Uh, all in all, high school high school was fun too. Besides being. So, what kind of fun things did you do in high school? What were the fun things? Well, I I didn't do I didn't do too much after school because all my athletic uh, uh, fun was done at our home field in Imperial Park. So we tried to get out of school as fast as we could. And it's and, and to get home. That was the only thing. We were so much of a clique, all the Napira Park people, that none of us went out for high school sports because we had our we had our own teams, we had our own Sandlot football team, we had our own baseball teams, uh, we had our own we used to play basketball in the uh, St. Mark's Parish Parish Hall. We played golf together. We didn't play golf with anybody else. Uh, everything was done within our within our small uh, area. So high school to me was getting there, having fun with the kids while I was there, uh, studying in school, mm -hmm. making sure I got my grades up so I could go to go to college. 
And how about social life for girls or dating, any of that in high school? No, I, 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 I uh, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I, when I enlisted in the, in the Air Force as an Air Force cadet, they ha had to take physical exams and uh, written exams, which took a, a week. And the last um, part of my enlistment, the last part of being okayed as a, an Air, Air Force cadet, I had to see a psychiatrist. We all did. I mean, that was, he asked questions like, I remember this one question. He said to me, Frank, uh, tell me what you consider a good time. Now I'm 18 years old, or 19. He says, tell me what you consider a good, a good time on a Saturday or on the weekend. And I tell him, I said, well, in the summer, practice some base, baseball with my guy, with my team. In the winter, we'd go over to St. Mark's Hall and we'd play basketball, going out to the movies with Marty and Freddie and Bobby. And I'm telling him all about this thing, and he says to me, no girls? I says, oh my God, what am I saying? <laughs> I says, oh yeah, of course there were girls, of course. I said, Yes, yes. Uh, I said, it was June. It was Ellen. It was Marina. It was Maureen. Yeah, I said we, we had parties. We had we had small dances at uh, at St. Mark's Hall. I said, but I didn't have a date. I mean, I, I never went steady with anyone. I went steady with Ellen Teachman. You know what that meant? She didn't go with anybody else, and I didn't go with anybody. Well, we never went together. If we were going to the movies, we'd all pay our own way. But so that, 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 that frightened me, <laughs> he said that. So uh, that, that was, yeah, we had, there were, we, we were boys and girls. We were just, uh, no one, no one, lots really, before, before we went into service, nobody really had a steady girlfriend. I would write in the service, I'd write to June, I would write to Ellen, I wrote to Loretta Dandel a lot. I wrote to uh, Marina. And I, it, it was just, uh, just that's the way it was until after the war. Then we realized we were men. We weren't boys anymore. <laughs> Marty Ocho and myself, as I say, were we were the closest friends. But I had my very, very first friend was Johnny Quinlan, who during the war became a true hero. He was the, uh, the gunner of, the tail, tail gun of the most famous bomber in World War II, which was the Memphis Bell. And uh, Johnny, was, Johnny was the one that brought me fishing. He was a couple of years older than me. He brought me fishing down to the creek. He made sure I had a BB gun so we would go crow hunting. We did trapping in the back backwoods. We hunted for um, rabbits, squirrels, anything that moved. And uh, he, was, he was a big influence on me because of his going into the Air Force. He enlisted on Pearl Harbor Day. We were all down at, down at our ball, ball field playing a, a football game against another section of Yonkers. And someone said, Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. And, who was Pearl Harbor? No one, no one, none of us heard, had known who Pearl Harbor was. And then it came over that it, it was Hawaii. Johnny Quinlan borrowed a nickel, took the trolley, trolley car, and enlisted in the Air Force that day, and we never saw him again. And he was, he, then, we, then we realized where he was, and he was in, uh, through his sisters, they lived next door to me in Diagonal. And uh, through his sisters, I was following where he was in the Air Force. Now, now that was 1941, December. I went in December 1942. So during that year, I hear all about Johnny, Johnny Quinn, and that's why I joined the Air Force, uh, was because of him. But we did something when we were kids. Next door to where we lived was a house that was old. Our house was the newest house in the Pira Park. And it was built in 1928. And it was the last house uh, in that part of Yonkers. And next door to us was a, a, 
an, old, an older house, and the people that owned the house were, I, I really don't know that much about her, but she, she was not, she, she was a complainer. The old lady was a complainer. Johnny and I were in the backwoods uh, checking out, to see if we can find some rabbits or squirrels. And we come across, in the winter, we come across a, a dead skunk, I mean, frozen solid, flat. And he'd been there for quite some time. And we, had, we always carried a burlap bag with us in case we got a bird or something. And Johnny says, I'm going to put this in a bag. He says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Now, I guess I was 11, 10, 10 or 11, about that age. He says, we're going to put this in old lady Connolly's furnace. Now, that house had what we now call uh, uh, indirect air and the heat. There's a huge furnace in the cellar, and it had great big vents coming up, and the heat would come in vents in the floor. And Johnny was a little chunky, you know, and the cellar windows. And this is right next door to where I live, and how my mother didn't see me, I'll never know. So we opened the window, and it was just about big enough for me to get. We knocked on the door first, make sure no one was home. And he said, now, get down there and throw this right into the furnace. Got a stick, I opened up the furnace, threw this skunk in. Got in the Pira Park, stunk for about a week. I mean, the smell of skunks in that area, and no one knew. No one knew, and my mother, to the day she died, didn't know it was me. <laughs> I would never tell her, <laughs> but it was that was that was Johnny Johnny Quinlan and me. We <laughs> but uh, we got caught. We got caught in the Sawmill River, swimming at the VAB, as we called it, the Bear Ass Beach, because I was thir thirteen. And it was all wooded area. I mean, the, the parkway went by, you couldn't see, but we had our clothes on this side and we're on the river on the other side. And who's standing there but a cop? <laughs> we had to go to him. And he gave us a scare. And he, he scared us so much we didn't go back for two weeks. <laughs> but that was, that was Johnny. My other friends, Freddie Dando, Marty Urcho, and Bobby McElroy, we were, we were like the, growing up later on, we were the, the big four. Marty and I were altar boys together at St. Anthony's Church. We started when we were 10, and I, I, we, we stayed altar boys until the day I enlisted, until the day I left for the Air Force. And uh, he left right after me. But we had a, uh, uh, two, sisters, kind of elderly, who lived in the south part of the air, of our area, and they had a brother who was an, an army chaplain. And at the age of 15, Marty, Marty and I were close in age, even though we, we were just a couple of months apart, but he was a year behind me in school because when he was uh, uh, five years old or four years old, he, he, had, he was in some sort of an accident and missed his first, first year in school. So Marty and I were, were partners, and uh, our parish priests had uh, volunteered us to say daily mass for this army chaplain. He was a colonel. Daily mass at the age of 15 in the middle of the summer was 6 o'clock in the morning. And th that didn't bode too well. We did that for three years. The last year, I said, I said to the chaplain, I said, if you're coming next year, can you make this mass a little bit later? It's kind of difficult for us at this age, getting up when we should be laying around in bed. He says, okay, he says, I'll make it 6.30. Now, that he, that he did. Marty, Marty, Marty and I were uh, close. His mother was, I considered his mother my second mother. They were, they were Czechoslovakian, and uh, she made the best, the best, best stuffed cabbage you ever, you ever tasted in your life. I mean, the absolute best. Anytime they had stuffed cabbage, Marty would say, my mother's making stuffed cabbage tonight. I go home and tell my mother, I'm not eating home tonight. I'm, eat, I'm eating with the Urchos. 
uh, I was there. He was at my house and I was at his house uh, constantly. Uh, e even uh, in high school, uh, after high school, uh, we, we, were, we were close. But Marty was, Marty was smart as a whip, too. He was a, became an accountant, a uh, travel agent, and uh, he would book our trips. Uh, he was an insurance parent. And, uh, uh, he, 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 traveled, he traveled the world free as a, uh, as a, as a travel agent. And now, Bobby, Bobby McElroy, Bobby McElroy was a, a horse of a different, different color. He was a little wise kid. But all the girls loved Bobby, Bobby McElroy. They, they all loved him. I mean, he was, uh, he was uh, the, the little lovable boy in the fair park. Freddie, Freddie Dando was um, uh, kind of, uh, I, know I wouldn't call him shy or anything, but uh, even as now, dull. I'd say he was dull, still is. But he was a good friend. He still calls me all the time, every time he's check on me. Uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby didn't play ball, but Freddie, Marty, and myself, we were the mainstays of the Napira Park Indians before the war and after the war. And uh, that was our life. Napira Park Indians was our life. And what kind of team was that? It was a baseball team. And uh, we, uh, after the war, we were all veterans, back again, and... Uh, uh, well, before we go uh, after the okay. war, why don't we um, see if there's anything else from your childhood, and then we'll move on to you graduated from high school and... Well, when I graduated from high school, I went to Manhattan College. Uh, I don't know what Marty did again, I forget. I, I think uh, uh, Marty graduated after me the following year, so... He went into the service. Uh, Freddie went to work at the uh, Alexander Smith carpet carpet shop as uh, in, in the office. His father, his father worked there. Uh, I don't know, as an, an accountant or a bookkeeper or whatever. So Freddie worked there until he joined joined the Navy. Bobby Bobby McElroy. Bobby McElroy went into the Navy because he graduated in 1942, and he stayed in the Navy. Uh, he came home, any time he came home on leave, uh, uh, we would know, because the girls in the Pura Park always kept tabs on where we were and uh, where, where all our friends, friends were. So what I, led you to Manhattan College? I went to Manhattan. What induced me to Manhattan mm -hmm. College? Well, I, I was going to I was going to study engineering, and uh, that's what I because I, I I was proficient in math. I had taken every math course that high school offered, and and I loved math. And I figured that would be that would be my. But I hated hated engineering, as as I found out in, after after uh, I came out of the service. It, it was. It, it wasn't what I thought, but I, I was. I stayed in Manhattan in my freshman year, and uh, in my the beginning of my so, uh, sophomore year, is when I enlisted in the Air Force. I enlisted first in, in one of the, in the Navy Air Force, uh, but my parents wouldn't sign me to go. They said to wait. So how old were you when you did I that? I was 18 when I did that. And then uh, I heard all about Johnny, Johnny Quinlan, and then I, I said, uh, it's the Army Air Force for me. And when, uh, when the recruiters came to the college, and they were there like uh, every other week, uh, and they dropped, they, raised, they dropped the draft, draft age from 21 to 18, and then I could do anything I want. So I enlisted at school. And come home and said, uh, I'm going, goodbye. And so, 
Well, what did your parents say when they heard that? You couldn't wait. Wait until you get your after license. I don't want to get your after. I don't want to go in. I didn't want to go in the infantry or any other part of the army. And my uh, all my life, I wanted flying, and this is it. And this is flying, and they accepted it. They, they accepted it after once once they realized that that was it. I mean, this war was not going to end tomorrow. So I left school. I went into the Air Force. So what happened to you in the Air Force? What was the first thing that happened? Well, that was the, actually the Air Force was the best thing that ever happened to me up until that time because it, it, it was discipline. I mean, uh, I never realized what discipline was until, until, I, until I became a cadet. Uh, being an Air Force cadet then, was equal to being a, an Annapolis cadet or a West, West, uh, West Point cadet. And uh, they, I, I strict, we, I remember, I remember the, the first night we had dinner, I eat square. Then you spoon up and boy, you think it's hard leaving, putting peas on a fork and getting it to your mouth. <laughs> But I, I, I tell you, I, I think the discipline is what, is what made all of us who were in the Air Force, who were flyers, what we were. And, uh, so where was your basic training? I, I did my basic training on, uh, we now call it uh, Camp board, Boardwalk in Atlantic City. In the middle of the, in the winter, December, we run out to the beach and, and the, the Drill instructor would say, okay, strip to the waist and the temperature coming off that ocean. We do our callus, calisthenics that way. And I spent, I spent a month in basic, basic training. And then they sent us to uh, various colleges around the, around the country to continue our cadet training. And I went to Michigan State College for a term. I went there for five, five months. I had a good time at Michigan State. And what did you study there? I studied everything from aeronautical engineering to map reading to everything that I was that I was going to study in uh, uh, Air Force pre pre flight going into going into uh, heavy cadet cadet training a lot of math and then a lot of other stuff like hygiene and uh, uh, health things physics. Which, which I had already completed at Manhattan College, so the, the, my, my uh, term at Michigan State College was repetitive, and it, it, was, it was easy. It was fun. So, uh, that's when I realized that co-eds were around. <laughs> there are a lot of co-eds. <laughs> In fact, most of the kids at Michigan State were girls, because most of the guys were gone. But uh, from Michigan State, I was sent to San Antonio Pre-Flight Aviation Cadet Center to weed out those who weren't eligible to become flyers. Uh, down at San, An San Antonio, uh, I would say there was maybe a, between the written testing and the phys physical testing and the mental I would say there was a 40% washout. 40% of, of them guys didn't, didn't make it and were transferred to uh, uh, either gunnery, gunnery school or back to the Army. Uh, I, I'm proud to say that uh, when, when, we, when we took the written test, we had to uh, give our, uh, we had to say what we wanted to be, a pilot, a bombardier, or a navigator. And uh, first choice, we put nine would be our first choice, eight would be our second choice, and seven would be our third. So I put down pilot training for my first choice, navigation, navigating third and second, and bombardier for third. Uh, after all the physicals and the mentals and uh, written exams, they, were, they listed all the uh, names on the bulletin board outside the orderly room and had P, 
N for navigator, B for bombardier. So I looked at the P, and I didn't see my name. I said, well, I'm not going to be a pilot. Then I looked on the N, and I didn't see my name. I said, God, I don't want to be a bombardier. So I looked under the Bs, and I don't see my name. I looked at the washout list, and I didn't see my name. Then someone said, hey, Frank, here's your name, and it was a short list. And it said, uh, following name, cadets report to major so-and-so at the cadet center. And I said, what the heck happened there? So my, I went in, my turn, I saluted, said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, stand at ease. He said, you picked, you, want, you picked pilot training for your first choice, navigation for second. I said, yes, sir. He says, well, you qualified for all three. He said, but we want you to be a navigator. So we'd like, we'd, we want to ask you to change your first choice from pilot training to nav navigating training. And I said, sir, it's volunteering, isn't it? And I said, as long as it's volunteering, I want to I, I wanna stay as it is. He says, we think you'd be a better navigator. So I said, well, I, I want to go to pilot training. He says, OK. So I did. They sent me to pilot, pilot training. Uh, I soloed after eight hours. I couldn't land the plane. I just could not land it. And it was nothing to do with my eyes. It was mental. I just could not land that plane. I'd look out over the nose. I'd look down. The ground would come up so fast, I'd bounce. So after about uh, two weeks of that, I got called into the cadet center again in that particular base. I was in Sykeston, Missouri. And uh, the captain in charge said to me, Mister, you're out. He says, you don't have a choice any longer. We're sending you to navigation school. And if you don't take it, you're going to be a gunner. I says, I'll take it. <laughs> and they were right. They were right. Because uh, uh, I went to navigation school in uh, Louisiana. And I graduated in the upper quarter of my class. And navigation, because of my math, came, I became proficient in celestial navigation. I became proficient in uh, dead reckoning navigation. And uh, celestial, dead reckoning, uh, radio. And then when I went overseas, I, uh, they sent me to radar school to become a radar navigator. So I guess they knew what they were, what they were talking about. And I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed the Air Force, except bombing missions. But I, I enjoyed being in the Air Force. So how long were you in all these different schools? When did you finally finish? Well, it took me, uh, it, San, San Antonio was, I would say, about two weeks of, uh, when I when I left Michigan State College, San Antonio was a couple of weeks of testing and weeding out, as I said, and then uh, from there I went to uh, uh, primary flying school at Sykeston, Missouri, and uh, I, I lasted I lasted about a month there because after I soloed, I. I left there alone. I just couldn't. I, I couldn't land it. I was bouncing that plane all over. The place. So then I, I went to uh, navigation school down in uh, Monroe, Louisiana, at Selman, Selman Field. I was there for a year. It was a year training in navigation. During that time, they sent me to gunnery school because the navigator on the plane is also the gunnery officer. So I went to gunnery, gunnery school. That was a five-week five course. Went back to navigation school. And um, after a year, uh, 13 months, I graduated. Uh, got my wings. Made me happy. And from there, I went to um, what they call OTU, which is Overseas Training Unit pick up a B-24 crew to train in the States before going overseas with this crew. And that was maybe a month or so. And where was that? I was in uh, 
successful. No, first, first we went to um, uh, Nebraska, Lincoln, Lincoln, Nebraska, and that was that was that was a fun town. That was another college college town. The University of Nebraska was there, and uh, had lots of dates. Because <laughs> I'll say, once you have wings and bars, <laughs> they flock. <laughs> But uh, from there, I went to Casper, Wyoming to do the rest of the overseas training, and then we went, then we went overseas. Well, I'll tell you a story at uh, Lincoln, Lincoln, Nebraska. We, uh, the, the sororities at the University of Nebraska would uh, send out notices to the um, various officers, the officers club, various flights, squadrons, and they would say uh, sorority dance would be held on such and such a date, it's an, and they would say, flying officers only, in big block letters. You know, I never, I, I, I never went, but my, bomb, my bombardier went, and met, a, met a girl, and he says, he says, come with me Saturday, come with me Saturday. So I did. I, went, I met a nice, nice, nice uh, sophomore that she was, and she was from Nebraska, and I, I dated her maybe three, three times, and this, my, Last day, I said to her, you girls have never been to the officers' club, have you? Now, the officers' club was a big deal. I mean, we had, we had Saturday nights, we had a band. Uh, I, I think we had uh, one of uh, Glenn Miller's uh, uh, three-piece band in them. So, uh, and, it, and it was great. You know, it, was, it was a good time. Everybody dressed. So I said to the girls, uh, we'll take you to the officers' club. Next Saturday, yeah, I said, we'll pick you up around 7. Great, they thought. Now, that, that Saturday, we were supposed to go to the office club. I got into a poker game Saturday morning. The poker game went on and on and on. And uh, uh, unlike, unlike the guys in the infantry who were making $50 a month, flying, I was making about 300 bucks a month. I've got, a, I've got about $1,000 sitting in front of me, and it's 5 o'clock, and Stan, who is my bombardier, comes in. He says, Frank, get dressed, showered. we got to pick up the girls at 7. And I said, Stan, do you think I'm leaving this money? Tell the girls I'm flying. <laughs> and I stood her up. And I, you know, I still remember that. You know, that, that, that was... Uh, and, and I lost the money. About midnight, I was tap, tapped out. But that's, uh, that, that, that's something to remember, because I felt badly about that. And I was, I was hoping in the, the rest of the month that I was going to be at, uh, in, the, in Lincoln that I, I wouldn't run into it, because I would have been embarrassed. So then from there, from there I went to, uh, you know, I got a, a, a seven-day leave go home before going overseas. And I'll tell you another funny story. I was leaving, I left from Casper, Wyoming, had to go to uh, pick up a plane at Topeka, Kansas, fly from Topeka to Chicago, and fly home from Chicago. It's civilian planes. So now I'm on this, uh, Topeka, Kansas, we, the night before my flight, we had, we had Party. I mean, man, we had we had a party. I mean, we, a lot of us got, including myself, we got pretty well bombed. When I got on that plane, I got on a civilian plane. I'm in the front, and I'm not feeling too good. I'm not feeling too good, not because of the plane. I'm not feeling too good because of the night before. So I'm starting to go. Now this is a, this is a commercial airliner, C-47 twin engine. The hostess says, on the street, says, attention, everybody. We got a fly boy up here who's going to get sick. Well, I did. And I went, mm, made sure I didn't. I got off the plane. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> so there I went home. Uh, I was home for a week. I went uh, from, uh, from home. I had to go to uh, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. Uh, hung around there for a couple of days and took a boat 
They took us to a boat, and uh, we thought we were going to Italy because they gave us Italian English dictionaries. That's how secret everything is. And we're saying, well, hey, maybe I'll see my grandfather's people or something. Next thing you know, we're in England. 